day, everybody. It is Klaxon here, and if you guys enjoy this video, remember to subscribe for more Ruby videos. This video was brought to you by my patrons over on Patreon, so thanks very much to them. Today, we will be looking at the two fondest creation stories that are in the Ruby Fairy Tales of Remnant collection, but before we get started, I do want to put out sort of a disclaimer that it's important to remember that the stories that are inside of the fairy tale book are not 100% canon. They are canon in the sense that the people of Remnant really tell these stories, but we cannot say that they are the factual way. We cannot say, yes, this story is 100% how the faunus were created, <laughs> right? And so a lot of people are taking certain things in the fairy tale book as 100% fact. And we need to remember that, especially with these two stories, these two stories are contradictory. They cannot both be true. And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to sort of summarize the story briefly. I'm going to talk about a uh, religious or other fairy tale references, like religious references, mythology references, fairy tale references from our real world, uh, and how like that's incorporated in telling a fictional fairy tale or fictional creation story and stuff like that. Um, I'm also going to just analyze passages I think are interesting, analyze the message, and then at the very end we are going to theorize, okay, like was this true? Did this happen? What parts do I think could have actually happened in terms of how the faunus were actually created? Ospin says that the stories have kernels of truth, grains of truth, right? And so basically what we're going to do at the end is sort of put together these grains of truth and come up with some theories based on the fairy tale stories. The Shallow Sea is about the god of animals who brings a bunch of people on an ark to the Shallow Sea. They jump in, they become faunus. That is basically the summary of the story, uh, you know, in the easiest way possible to explain, I guess. And that's sort of like, this is how faunus were made. The gods like chose a bunch of people and then they became faunus and they lived on this island paradise. <laughs> and so uh, to actually get into stuff I want to analyze though, it's interesting that the god in the shallow sea can actually shift or transform and have animal-like uh, features because this aligns with what we've seen of both of the brothers canonly, like canonly within the lost fable, right? Both of them have horns and like transform and sort of shift right in front of our eyes. So it's very interesting that whoever like wrote this story uh, seemed to have gotten a factual part of how the brothers uh, actually were, right? Canonly. And so we will talk about that a little bit later uh, in terms of uh, the faunus creation theories. What's interesting too for me is that it says the god of animals was fascinated by humans with their ability to create things and adapt to new situations and indeed change themselves almost as readily as the god could change their spots, right? And so this passage seems to imply to me, especially uh, if you've read uh, The Two Brothers, which is also in the collection, that the god of animals is actually the dark brother uh, because there is a passage in, again, The Two Brothers story about how the god of darkness perceives humans and it is very, very similar and basically the god of animals and the god of darkness basically both admire humans ability to create things to change to adapt uh, adapt to new situations stuff like that so there is considerable overlap uh, and so you guys can see uh, I'm gonna put the full quote on screen but the god of darkness was interested in testing humans' limits and admired their resourcefulness, and then it goes on to explain what the god's been doing, right? Uh, like, to, to test that, I guess you could say. Uh, and the god of darkness saw how they thrived in facing challenges and grew in overcoming them, right? So that would actually point to me that if the god in this story is true, I guess, it would be actually the god of darkness in this story. And so basically what the god of animals goes to do, though, is he searches for a bunch of humans or, that don't fit in, that are misfits or outcasts and there are many different religious references here um, I'm gonna pick out the ones I saw I don't know if you guys saw on Twitter but I sort of made a post about like yeah so the myths and literatures class that I took for my English minor was a university semester where I had decided to take six courses for some reason and if you guys don't know for university students here the required not required but like the recommended number is like four or five and so I took six and it was like basically insanity. Um, and so I've blocked a lot of that semester out. I do not remember a lot of it and I cannot find my notes. So if I miss some like uh, myth references, you guys understand what happened. Like that entire semester of school for me is like just totally blacked out in my brain. Like it was, it was a traumatic, uh, it was a traumatic time, very stressful time. But 
I did go to Catholic school for like 12 years. So here's what comes to mind for me. The Ark is obviously, uh, you know, the, the Noah's Ark sort of thing, like the chosen uh, people going in an Ark and floating away. That's very Noah's Ark-ish, uh, right? Uh, leaping into the water actually reminds me of baptism. And oh God, I don't remember which Jesus story it is, but it's like sort of like that, like Jesus, like, you know, like people get like baptized in the water and stuff like that. I, I guess I don't remember which one it is at all, but you guys understand what I mean. Leaping into the water is like baptism. I think it's Jesus that gets baptized in the water or maybe Jesus baptizes someone in the water and that's like how it all how it all started, I guess. Like, how bad does them all start? I do not remember. Anyway, uh, and then we have, like, the island paradise idea is very Adam and Eve. Like, there are some other things, like Greek mythology that have that. Uh, it's a very common, like, the idea of a paradise island or a paradise garden, right? That's all, like, I think most mythologies have something like that, but that's basically what I'm thinking of. And we also get the god of animals taking, like, the uncomfortable form of a human, right? And so I'm guessing they mean, like, an actual, like, skin human and not sort of the human bodies that we see the god of light and god of darkness in, uh, in the lost fable and stuff like that, because they go around telling people to come to the shallow sea, you know what I mean? So I'm assuming they weren't just in their purple or yellow, like, human form, but with the horns and stuff like that, uh, right? But maybe the god of darkness is just kind of uncomfortable as a human, because we see after he talks to Salem, he's sort of like, eh. And so that's also a possibility, too, that he was just like a purple blob going around. I don't know. But yeah, that's a very common, especially in, like, I mean, obviously, again, in like, Catholic stuff, like, Jesus is, like, the human form of God and stuff like that, um, but then you also sort of have in Greek myths, like, Zeus coming down as a human and in human form, like, no one knows it's actually Zeus type of thing, so he can mess around <laughs> and all that stuff. Fuck some women. So, yeah, uh, that, those are the references that I see here. Uh, so to continue, the humans jump into the water and they gain animal traits, uh, and so what I think is interesting is they say the water hasn't changed us, it washed away the lies to reveal what we've been under the surface. So basically what they're saying is that this is who they've been all along. The shallow sea just wiped away all of their fears and their shallow minds and that, you know, the faunus traits were there deep down, I guess. They're becoming their true selves. That is the point. But there's a small group of people on the boat that are not very convinced. They call the god of animals a monster. And it says that they are too horrified uh, or too uh, too afraid to take the leap of faith. And so they basically get sent home by the god of animals. The god of animals was like, I picked you special. You disappointed me. I can't believe that you would not jump into the water and become a faunus. Like, get out of here. And basically the explanation at the end of the book is that the descendants of those humans, the ones that were not brave enough to carry, uh, to take the leap of faith, basically like carry envy in their hearts, resent the faunus, you know, for doing what they never could, basically. And so that is uh, basically that uh, in terms of the story. And so what Ozpin says is that this is a story, because I don't know if you guys know, there are Ozpin notes in this story, and they're also read by Shannon McCormick, so like, buy the audiobook. The notes really interest me because he says that this is a story told to Fauna's children, and it is sort of like, you know, this explanation for little kids, I guess, about racism, you know what I mean? Like, this is why the humans are, like, racist towards us or have prejudice because, like, they hold the envy in their hearts from way back then, right? It's basically that sort of explanation. I also think it's interesting how there's sort of a cultural appropriation versus appreciation discuss it. Like, Ozpin is like, I don't know if I have the right to put this story in the collection, but at the same time, like, people should be exposed to other cultures uh, so we can, like, learn to appreciate each other and, like, learn each other's stories and and fairy tales and stuff like that. So yeah, that's kind of interesting how Ozpin talks about that because obviously you know, that conversation has been happening for decades, like, numbers of years, but it's really become a big thing in the past couple of years, especially, like, I mean, you know, through social media, things are more uh, prominent and cultural appropriation is a very big deal, right? Uh, so it's very interesting how that discussion is sort of going on and that Ozpin is trying to show appreciation by including this story so people can learn more about the faunus and we can, like, all accept each other, <laughs> right? And so that's sort of the idea with that. Um, and then he also says that the story 
has fallen out of favor, basically because after the Great War and the Faunus were all sent to an island, like the idea of an island paradise just for Faunus, right, didn't exactly, didn't exactly vibe with everyone anymore when they were segregated, right? So the story has fallen out of favor. And here's my interpretation of the story as a whole, because Osborn does in a lot of them basically give like, here's what I think the meaning of the story is, but I don't care, I'm analyzing it myself. And I feel like that what's really important in this story is that everyone brought to the island was a misfit or an outcast, right? That didn't fit in among humans. And now together, the outcasts are all together. They're able to take this leap of faith and like become their true selves, right? And I think that the whole idea here is that the ones that were too horrified or terrified, whatever, too scared to jump, resent the other people, like the other people that are just like them for being brave enough to be themselves unashamedly. And I feel like that that's very important because you have like an outcast watching an other outcasts like finally find happiness and then that outcast is like well I don't like that they found happiness and I'm too scared to try to find happiness right like that's a sort of idea and I think that when you're ashamed of yourself you tend to project that onto others who are happy or proud because you yourself are insecure right and for me, like, you guys know I'm bisexual, right? Uh, and so I think of this in the context of, like, stuff like homophobia uh, and stuff like that. Like, I feel like that a good portion of people um, are bothered by other people being proud or being happy or, like, freely loving someone because they are insecure in who they are. You know what I mean? Like, that some, like, there's a chunk of people that are homophobic that are, like, like, I don't know. It's sort of a weird thing to explain, but I sort of see it as, like, that person has love and I don't and they're you know weird so I'm gonna attack that person because they're weird I'm normal why can't I find love right and so it's sort of that whiny attitude is that someone is insecure of themselves maybe they don't have like that type of love in their life so they see you know like a same-sex couple and they're like how could they get together but I can't find anyone. Like, it's it's totally an insecurity thing that people, you know, sort of, you know, want to ruin other people's happiness when they see other people embracing who they are inside or loving, like, you know, who they want to love and all that stuff. That's what I think. That's just my personal opinion is I think that a lot of it comes, uh, you know, from some sort of insecurity to be like, but they're weird. I'm normal. Why can't I have things? Right? And so, you know, what's interesting about this story is like, despite the outcasts in the story also being outcasts, they turn against the other outcasted people when there should be unity because the other outcasted people the ones that end up leaving right are too afraid you know to take the same leap and they resent the other outcast for finding happiness instead of staying like them if that makes sense that's how I see that story that's my personal interpretation but let's talk about the next one which is the judgment of Faunus so this story is actually set in a war between humans and animals so remember like literal animals not Faunus Faunus, right? So, like, bears and wolves and, like, not bear faunus, bears, right? So that's what this story is about, is that basically, you know, the animals are strong and they can, like, well, you know, like, um, claw at things or something. They're big and strong and, like, the Grimm have no interest in animals. So the humans are like, well, what the fuck? Like, we want to, you know, we, we wish that we were animals because we get attacked by the Grimm and stuff. But then the animals are also jealous of the humans because the humans can build, they can use dust. And I think that dust thing is very important, right? Because the idea of dust means that this story would have been created, um, after in the new world, if that makes sense. Because dust only happened after the gods wiped out the original population. Uh, and so this would be, again, post Lost Fable, post, you know, the snap, if you want to call it that, right? And so, you know, the god comes along, asks them why they're fighting, you know, and it's important to note again that this god also has the description of the brothers having branching horns in a human body. Um, as for which brother it is, it I don't know, like, it sort of sounds like the light god just in how he passes judgment and stuff, and he doesn't have the same sort of paragraphs, if that makes sense, as the other, like, a god of animals in the story that, like, sort of overlap with the dark god, and so in this one, it does seem to be like it's a god of light situation, uh, going on here, just by how he speaks, uh, if, again, this god in this story is supposed to be, like, one of the gods, or was one of the gods, and again, we'll talk about that at the end. And so basically, 
there's war, right? Um, and so both parties are like, the other one isn't like me. And the story's like, fear is a universal language, huh? And then the animals basically say, like, that the humans have evil inside of their hearts and are capable of destruction, which again is true because the god of darkness gave humans that capability. Uh, and so that's why the animals are like, well, we can't trust the humans. Like, they have evil inside of them, but we don't have any evil because we don't really, you know, we weren't, we weren't designed that way, basically. And that the uh, humans say that the animals are stronger but won't fight against the grim with them and so the you know the god is like okay well why won't you fight against the grim with them though and the animals are just like well you know we tried working with them before but they wanted to make us property and basically like grim fighting slaves and then the humans are like but we wanted just to keep them in place because we were afraid they may steal something like you know like we tried to put the animals into slavery but it's fine they could have steal something you know whatever obviously that's not <laughs> that's not good the god basically says, judge not what others might do, but by what you see them do, right? So he's basically like, hey, if the animals didn't actually steal anything, don't treat them like a criminal already, right? And so basically the god goes on to say that they've grown to see the worst in, in each other uh, and that they need to celebrate uh, one another's best qualities and embrace their differences. And so the humans and the animals basically both get a proposition and the god is like, I'll like pass judgment on you. So the humans are like, mm -hmm, the god is definitely gonna side with us and the animals are like, oh, the god is definitely gonna side with us because he has horns, so he's, like, not really human, right? And so the god, like, basically passes judgment and he gives uh, them both animal features. And so the animals become Faunus and the humans become Faunus. And then it doesn't matter which one of them was human or animal anymore. Now they're just all Faunus and they're all like a collective and accept each other. And so then the Faunus try to go back to their human villages, like where they came from, from the war. And the humans are like, nah, we don't know y'all weirdos. Like, who are you? And so... I really like this line. We don't know you, cried the villagers, their faces stony and their voices cold. We don't trust you, be gone. And then the humans are like, were we so narrow-minded when we were humans? And then the other faunus are like, yeah. And so obviously the humans realize their mistake. And then the grim attack, because there's all these bad feelings, right? And the villagers see this as an intentional attack and that's how the divide starts. That basically those humans in that village run away and they're like, the faunus like came and they brought the grim. And that is why there is racism. That is basically, uh, this story. And so Ospin says that the theme of the story is that for Faunus, uh, that they believe that their story is still unfolding and they've yet to find their true purpose and how that's, like, comforting. Uh, and so I'll put that little piece of, of dialogue on screen that Ospin says that that's the moral because the Faunus are still to this day trying to find a place, like, to call home and without persecution and stuff. And so that most Faunus stories are open-ended. My other interpretation of the story is how this applies to modern Faunus issues. Like, the the stereotypes that the humans and the animals both apply to each other are stereotypes that are now amongst the faunus, that the unchanged humans now apply to the faunus. Like, how in the story they were like, the animals will steal. Like, we hear from Weiss in volume one, two... Mm. We hear from Weiss in one of the volumes that, like, all Faunus do is lie, cheat, and steal. And so that was sort of, you know, that was the stereotype that the humans put onto the animals, that they would steal stuff from them. Uh, and that animals were afraid to be kept in cages, and that's actually what happened to the Faunus, as we see in the Lost Fable, uh, when Ozpin is brought back. Um, and that the you know, the animals were afraid to be in cages and they were afraid to be put into slavery, but that's exactly what happened to the Faunus. And so it's very interesting how those elements of the story come into play. And even though the story is basically supposed to be, like, I think it's supposed to be, like, the humans and the, like, and the animals come together. Like, look at that. That's nice, right? Like, I think that ultimately the story doesn't really push that message. It doesn't push, like, oh, like, humans and Faunus have equal transgressions against each other. If only they could work together, then there would be peace, right? Like, humans are ultimately pushed to be the problem in the end, because they are still closed-minded, and I feel like that's important, right? Because some people may see the story as, see, both sides are, ex like, responsible for racism, and I'm like, no, like, uh, that's not how it works. Like, I don't think that this is a both side situation, because the humans were ignorant, um, and, like, all of that stuff, and then when the humans became Faunus, the humans were still ignorant, right? It's the left 
leftover humans who, like, do everything both the animals and the old humans were afraid of, basically. This is gonna be a bit difficult to explain, but basically what I'm saying is, is that the worst fears of the animals and the worst fears of the humans actually came true and were sort of, you know, done to them by the humans that were left over, like, by these other humans that did not change into Faunus. And so what I mean by that is, is that the animals were afraid that the humans would put them in cages, right? And so that's, like, one of the fears that are listed uh, in that sort of sequence in the story. And then the humans are afraid that the animals will not fight the Grim with them, right? And so those are, again, one of the fears that are listed, right? And so, like the animals are not the problem anymore after the faunus are created. Like, the animals are never mentioned again, which is why I don't see this as like, oh, both sides did wrong. Like, no, it ends up pointing back to the humans are wrong because the humans do not fight the Grimm with the faunus, right? They don't help the faunus fight the Grimm. And so what the old humans were afraid the animals do, those humans ended up doing to them. Right? You guys understand what I mean? And then the animals were afraid that humans would put them in cages, and then the leftover humans put the faunus in cages, right? And so I don't think it's really a both sides thing, you know what I mean? Like, the humans are still responsible at the end of the day for faunus racism, for prejudice, and for slavery. And so even though some people may see that face value, this story is trying to be like, if we can accept our differences, well, there can be peace, right? Like, the important thing to note is, like, it's not the animals at the end of the story not letting anyone in the village it's the leftover humans like the animals are no longer a problem anymore after the faunus are created but the humans are still the problem so i think that that's like an interesting thing to note i hope that i explained that well but it's not really a both sides story when you really look at it some humans may take it as that some humans may be like see like it was both sides that were afraid of each other and wrong and all that stuff like i already explained before but when you actually look at the story deeper the end result is that humans are still the bad ones Humans are still the ones that did all this shit, right? And so I kind of like that, that they snuck that in there to make sure that we know, like, even though it was both sides back then, when the faunas and the animals became whole, it was basically the humans that were doing everything that was feared, uh, like, in the first place. The humans trapped the faunas in cages. The humans didn't help the faunas fight the Grimm. Like, it was basically all on the human side of things. Right? Because the faunus had already accepted the humans, because some of the faunus were once human, right? They wanted to live among the humans, it's the humans that didn't let them. Right? So that's, I hope that that's explained uh, in a way that you guys understand. I, I did that like three times, I did not know how to explain that. So, um, so now to get to the part which you guys have been waiting for, people have asked me which story I think is true. And again, I think that there's more nuance going on here, and we need to remember that the stories are not 100% canon to how the faunus were created. But I do have some ideas, and I want to sort of look at the common parts of both story that we know to be true, right? So let's look at the timeline for a minute. In both the stories, humans already exist, and we know that the gods of light and darkness made humanity, and that Ozma does not recognize the Faunus when he is reincarnated, and so that lets us with two possibilities, is that either the gods did make the Faunus in between Ozma being dead and Salem campaigning for humanity to turn against the gods, right? So you guys understand what I mean? Like, Ozma dies, uh, you know, and, like, Salem tries to go talk to the gods, but the gods are like, no, all right? Uh, and then Salem rallies humanity together to fight against the gods, and the gods leave. Somewhere in between that, you know, the gods made the faunus for whatever reason, for shits and giggles, <laughs> really, who knows, right? And so that's option one. Option two is that the gods were never involved in the first place, and that faunus were created after humanity was dusted. And we do know that the gods share the appearance of how we know the gods to have canonly existed, uh, I guess you could say. Like, basically, the way that they describe the gods lines up with the facts that we know canonly about how the gods look. And so, again, I see two possibilities here, that either the gods were actually there to make the faunus, or the gods were not there. Really, that's, like, the two uh, things. And that the people of Remnant just took inspiration from the uh, gods that they heard about in the two brothers. Basically, no one actually, like, you know, saw the gods and the gods did not actually do this, but the concept of the gods was basically borrowed or plucked from other fairy tales and made into this one because we see that a lot with fairy tales and myths and stuff that certain elements from certain fairy tales are just stolen right plucked taken and then applied 
to new ones. And we also have an example of that uh, in one of the other stories. And basically, like, a concept um, from the the White Witch, right, of white skin and veins and, like, uh, black, like, grim eyes and stuff like that element is plucked from the White Witch and applied uh, to the Grim Child, even though we know, like, what happens in the Grim Child does not cause the white veins and does not cause the black grim eyes, right? And so that's uh, sort of an example, I guess, of that, is that the gods and how they are described in the story may have just been the writers being like, hmm, well, in the two brothers, the gods are described like this, so I'm just gonna take that and put it in there. And so here's the interpretation that I like best, and that is that the shallow sea is canon and the judgment of Faunus is not. That the judgment of Faunus was just a way for humans to sort of, you know, explain Faunus racism and do this, like, it was both sides thing. It was the animals and it was the humans, like, type of, like, narrative like that. And, like, I would personally think that the gods made the Faunus after Ozma's death, but before Salem got the gods to destroy the world. And that would explain why Ozma doesn't recognize the Faunus. So, basically, Ozma's death happens, the gods make the Faunus, Salem attacks the gods, and the gods dust the world. World. So basically, while Salem is trying to convince the humans to fight against the gods, the gods made the Faunus. Uh, and then when the world was dusted, Faunus just naturally came back like humans did. So more or less, I think we can disregard the judgment of Faunus, especially because animals and humans probably never had a war. That doesn't really make any sense. Like, animals don't have the intelligence to war with humans, right? And so I feel like that is the more, like, myth and, like, made-up fairy tale part of the story. Uh, but I feel like the shallow sea could actually be the more problematic one. And I think that what could have happened here is remember how Salem is like, oh god of darkness, like I came to you first because you are the strongest and the wisest, so I'm coming to you for help. And the god of darkness was like, yeah baby, somebody actually likes me. And then when he found out Salem tricked him, he was like, you know what? Like, fuck you, <laughs> right? And so what I'm basically thinking is, is that the god of darkness thought that no one liked him and all that stuff, that no one worshipped him. Uh, and then Salem comes along and is basically like, I worship you, psych. And so, uh, you know, how I would see the Faunus creation story would be that the god of darkness, Ego, was bruised. So he decided to go around and pick some chosen one human misfits to worship him and to also be like animals and sort of in more in his likeness, uh, basically to recover from the Ego blow that Salem dealt him. So that would make sense to me. So again, basically for this theory... I would basically say the incident with Salem happened, the God of Darkness was sad, and so the God of Darkness took some humans who he felt like would, like, worship him and are sort of outplaced in society because the God himself, like, the God of Darkness feels outplaced and not, like, good enough, like, compared to his brother. So he took all the humans that think that they're not good enough, brought them to worship him on this island of paradise. And then, you know, all of those people were dusted, uh, and then they just naturally, like, came back, like, with evolution or whatever. However, the humans came back, the Faunus also came back because they were, like, made. Uh, right? So there are, um, there are some things that I do want to talk about in the Judgment of Faunus, though, even though I don't think that it's probably the right one. I think that it's important to note that even though in the Judgment of Faunus they do talk about dust, uh, the humans wouldn't have known about the Lost Fable in the world before, and so obviously if somebody was writing a Faunus creation story, they would start at the beginning of their known world, right? Um, and so the thing about that, though, is, is that it has to be inaccurate because the gods had already left. Like, the judgment of Faunus, I think, speak more as a metaphor to me of why Faunus prejudice exists versus something that actually happened because dust existing and the gods existing is not correct. Like, the gods cannot exist while dust exists because we know that the gods already left by the time the dust uh, started existing, right? Um, and so I feel like that that story is probably the one with the most contradictions and probably not the most true. Uh, and so here's one final explanation, right? Because again, our first theory is that the god of darkness did it, and then when everyone got dusted, they just naturally re-evolved alongside of the humans, right? And so that would mean that the shallow sea story uh, is actually the true interpretation of how the Faunus were created. But I do have another explanation. It's possible that the Faunus weren't created by the gods at all, and for some reason the Faunus just naturally evolved alongside humans in the new world. And I know that's not really the answer that people are looking for, but I'm basically thinking if the humans just naturally evolved and sprung up again, why not uh, some evolution in terms of, you know, the Faunus? Because here's the thing. 
thing, right? The humans were made by the gods in the Lost Fable, and so I'm assuming that they didn't have to go through, like, any evolution, like, we have evolution in our world, right? I'm assuming that they just were born, but for humanity to sort of regain, I'm sort of imagining, like, a standard, like, how humans evolved on Earth sort of thing, but applied to Remnant, uh, and so through that way, you could have humans that have animal fe features through, like, natural evolution. And though I like the first idea about the God of Darkness, uh, basically creating the faunus and all that stuff, um, it's also possible that there's a third explanation, right? So we have the God of Darkness did it and the Shallow Sea is, like, mostly true. We have the faunus just appeared after, uh, with no gods involved and that the Judgment of Faunus story is obviously contradictory because there cannot be dust and gods, uh, and so that the faunus could have just naturally evolved, and again, I know that's not the exciting answer that everyone wants, but I think that that's definitely just possible is that it was just due to natural evolution. My third and kind of crack theory is that there were actually no gods involved, but there was magic in the magical water that the gods left behind. Because what I'm thinking is the shallow sea may be the lake that the god of light threw Salem in. Because remember, that pool of water, a lot of people were like, but Cal, it was an immortality pool. It's not. It seemed to have been a creation pool, and it does whatever the god of light wanted. Maybe it's possible that this creation lake is still on remnant, and just whoever enters it ends up getting what they want. For example, a group of people discover the lake and they want more strength against the Grim. And we already have this preconceived notion in both stories that animals have superior traits that can be useful for fighting against the Grim, right? And so maybe they thought, you know, if we were part animal, maybe the Grim wouldn't target us. If we were part animal, we ha would have animal traits to fight against the Grim. And so the shallow sea is the creation pool and then the humans went into the creation pool and they came out with Faunus traits. And so this again would have been after the gods left, but just, you know, humanity going around and discovering the creation pool and the creation pool just makes them or like gives them like creation into whatever they want. Does that make sense? Like you guys understand what I mean? Like they went into the lake and that's what the lake did to them. And so it's almost like a mutation. It's how like when Salem jumped into the Grim pool, she sort of like became darkness in a sense. Like when somebody went into the creation pool, and I think that is what Salem wanted to be deep down, right? So when she jumped into the darkness pool, that was because she wanted to be darkness. She wanted to sort of be a part of the Grimm, in my opinion, right? And so the light pool would function the same way, where some humans just stumbled across it, like had a little swim, and then they came out with faunus traits because deep down, that's what those uh, humans really wanted. Now, it's important to note that when people cannot explain something, they make up gods. When you don't know the cause of storms, you make up Zeus and Poseidon, right, and other Greek myths. And so it's possible that the gods didn't do anything, but people just chalked up natural evolution to gods, right, as the people in our world have, right? Or if they couldn't explain magical water, they were like, the gods did it, right? And so I think that, you know, when something is unexplained, and the unexplained thing could be natural evolution or magical leftover water, they just made up a god that did it in order to explain, and they used the gods that they already had. And it's really just simple, like, either the gods did this or they didn't. If the gods did this, again, I think the valid timeline that I made with the god of darkness theory, I think that's the best one. If the gods didn't do this, I think the magical water pool is a good idea, especially because, you know, the shallow see and then maybe it was just natural evolution. Just to talk about this briefly, um, people have theorized that Salem made the faunus to sow discourse into humanity, and to that, I feel like that they would try to point to that in some regard. Like, apparently the fairy tale of the White Witch, which is Salem, exists, like, in Remnant, I guess, and so it isn't in the fairy tale book, but it's mentioned in the fairy tale book as a fairy tale that exists in Remnant. So it'd be weird for the people to create a whole new image, like, basically to paste the the Brothers Grimm image onto Salem if they really like saw the White Witch do it. So I don't think that it, I don't think that anything in these two stories actually point to it being Salem except one thing. Uh, and so what's sort of important is that in the Shallow Sea, I'm pretty sure that God is capitalized. And the only piece of evidence I have uh, in terms of it possibly having been Salem using her magic is that God is lowercase for the entire story of the Judgment 
Aphonis. Uh, and if you guys don't know, like, when God is in lowercase, it's basically, like, the not real gods, right? You know, like, especially, like, in a Catholic sense, it's like, if you're talking about a false god, like a Greek god, you're supposed to use the lowercase. Like, that's basically what it is. And Salem went around trying to convince people that she was a god when she really wasn't. So God in lowercase generally means, like, not a real god. Uh, whereas the god of animals is capitalized in the shallow sea, so it's implied it's the real gods, God, uh, is not capitalized when it's in the judgment of Faunus, and God is capitalized in the brother story, right? So there's sort of this implication there, uh, which I think is very, very interesting, is that the judgment of Faunus has sort of a false god, whereas the shallow sea has a real god, and then the brother story obviously has the real gods, and we know that for a fact. So yeah, this was kind of messy. Again, there isn't a clear answer. I just wanted to analyze the fairy tale and give my theories as to what could be happening. Like I already mentioned, I like the God of Darkness theory the best just because there's sort of this idea that he got his ego bruised and so he decided to like make a modification to humans to make himself feel better, right? And then like later he dusted them and then they just naturally came back anyway. I kind of like that idea. I do like the magical water idea as well because it sort of fits in with the thing. Like there is still magic in the world, but also when people have unexplained or supernatural occurrences, they chalk it up to gods and stuff like that. So I do like the magical water one, but yeah, there isn't really a concrete answer, <laughs> but I hope that you guys enjoyed nonetheless, and I will talk to you guys in the next one. Bye guys.